All right, so um, thanks, everyone, for joining. My name is Sonny Scroggin. I'm here to talk to you today about taking Elixir to the metal. Uh, so probably not the metal you might be thinking of. Uh, I've heard some people thought this was going to be like an Elixir and music type talk, um, or maybe a something like bare, running Elixir on bare metal. Um, but I think there's other projects out there that are, are doing that. Um, but uh, no, this is basically talking about using NIFs, so native implemented functions. So um, I've been using Elixir for the last four-ish, four and a half years or so. Um, and uh, it's been an incredible, uh, incredible amount of time that I've been able to uh, be in the, in the ecosystem, in the community, and learning. Uh, lots of crazy stuff about this amazing thing. Um, and really, it's just this amazing uh, virtual machine, the Beam, that gives us this like trinity of these three awesome buzzwords that we hear all the time, the concurrency, fault tolerance, and distribution. Uh, but one thing that I think people lack in understanding when they come to the Beam is that it's a really amazing orchestration platform. Um, and if you were in Robert Verding's talk this morning, uh, he was talking about the fact that you know, when you're writing in Erlang, they designed the system to be able to talk to low-level uh, you know, hardware and things like that. Um, we're dealing with telecom systems and stuff like that. So they've really designed these ways that you can interact with the outside world um, with the Beam. And so there's all these other uh, types of ways that you can do that. There's ports. There's Erl interface. There's C nodes, which uh, is going to be one of the things I want to explore in, in, after this talk. But um, uh, there's also port drivers, which I think port drivers are kind of on their way out. Um, in, in they're uh, basically going to kind of pushing forward on uh, native implemented functions. So, um, and so this talk is really about native implemented functions. Um, but some integration examples of this in the wild is like the mix tool or rebar uses ports for external communication for tools like Git uh, for like re retrieving your dependencies and whatnot. Um, Erlang's inet driver is uh, a port driver. It's for all the networking stuff. It's written in C. Uh, supports all the TCP and UDP uh, communication for Erlang applications. Uh, another example is Jiffy, which is a native implemented function for uh, encoding and decoding JSON. So, <clears throat> so this talk, I said we're going to talk about NIFs. Um, they are native implemented functions. Generally, they're usually implemented in C or C++. Um, and it's a feature that's really kind of reserved for wizards, so people that actually know what they're doing. Um, so why would you want to write a NIF? Um, really, the thing is, is that as fast as Erlang is, Sometimes it's not fast enough. Uh, and you know, it wasn't designed for raw CPU throughput, um, but the, the Beam was really this awesome runtime system that guarantees kind of uh, latency across the, all the cores on your machines. Um, and so you'll need to write an if if you want to talk directly to hardware, um, or maybe you want to interop with some graphics library, um, or maybe the functionality that you need already exists in some native library. So maybe there's like a C library that already does all this crazy stuff, and you need uh, it would be like take too long or be too expensive to implement that functionality in Erlang or, or Elixir. Um, but um, when you write a NIF, one of the first things you're going to see is this big giant warning uh, when you go and read the documentation on, on NIFs. Um, and it's really, really important that. NIFs are uh, written in such a way that they're well behaved. Uh, and we'll get into the details of this. Um, but NIFs, they're, they're called just like any other function. Um, they, the, the actual library, it's, uh, the code itself lives in a dynamic library, like a shared object or a DLL, depending on your operating system. And what happens is, is that the uh, native code is basically replaces the uh, the normal functions inside your module at load time. So when the beam is loading your module, it 
uh, loads the native code and then goes, goes ahead and actually replaces all the other functions that are in your module um, that are uh, match the names. Uh, so NIF functionalities, they you know, read and write Erlang terms. Um, you can deal with binaries. Um, there's also uh, this really cool thing that we'll talk about called resource objects. Um, it allows you to do threads and concurrency and stuff like that. So this here is kind of how you would normally set up an, uh, an, a module for a NIF. Um, you've got this onload module attribute that you can pass an atom to to specify which function you want uh, the beam to call when it loads your module. So we've got this init zero function here. Um, we can go ahead and use code privder, uh, passing in our application name here, um, which will go, go ahead and get the path to the privder of that application. And then we just append the uh, lib fast JSON there as a string or a character list. Uh, and then we call Erlang load nif, and we pass in the path to our dynamic library. Um, after that, we have our functions that we want to export. Um, for the actual functions that are in our, in our NIF. And in this case, what you can do is you can either define the actual implementation of what this function is supposed to do in Erlang or Elixir. Um, but if it's a NIF, uh, so it, if, it's, uh, if for some reason the NIF code can't load at, at load time, then uh, the n normal implementation will be called. But in this case, the normal implementation is just to raise uh, in Erlang NIF error. So let's take a quick look at the structure of a NIF in C. Um, this is kind of from the, uh, the Erlang NIF API that's provided. So we include this Erl NIF H. Um, we get our functions here. So we have an encode and a decode. We have the Erl environment, which is passed in as the first argument to every uh, NIF function. We have an integer of how many, the count of arguments. Uh, that the function takes. And then we have a, kind of a vector of the, the actual Erlang terms that are provided to the function. Um, and then each uh, NIF just returns an Erlang term. All right, so this Erlang, this Erl env uh, type is uh, just an opaque type, kind of represents um, the environment that uh, can be, can be housed, housed all these Erlang terms. Um, and it allows you to uh, also access information about the calling process, so like the PID of the process and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, all terms in an environment are basically valid uh, until the, the environment is deallocated. So, um, and it's basically just, just used, uh, you, can't really, you can't really call any methods on it or anything like that, you just have to use the, uh, the actual like, NIF API to uh, do, do various things with it. Similar to the Erlang, or the Erl NIF term, it's also this opaque type. Um, you kind of have to use the, the functions to like, ask, hey, is this an atom? Is this a, a string or whatever? Um, and so there's just these uh, kind of types that you have to use within your, your NIFs here. So um, the last thing you need to do here is uh, specify all of the um, kind of exports and map them to the, the Erlang module and your, your actual code. So you have this uh, list of structs that you export here. And you have the, the string is the, the function in your Erlang code. The second here is the arity and then your uh, function pointer to your actual NIF itself. Um, and then the last thing you do here is you actually exp uh, is what creates the and binds the NIF together with your module. So you specify the <coughs> module here in this Erl NIF init. And you'll notice here that we have elixir.json. So if you're creating an elixir module, all uh, beam code, uh, the beam file itself is elixir.json. Your, your module, um, and so we have to prefix that there. Uh, then we pass in our NIF funks, and then a bunch of nulls. So those are um, basically uh, supposed to be like pointers to various callbacks that you can, can call for like when the beam is being hot code reloaded and stuff like that. You can specify how you want that to work. Um, so but I don't know about you, but I am not a C programmer, and so I have absolutely no 
clue what I'm doing when it comes to C. Um, and so <clears throat> when I was uh, learning about NIFS, I was also learning about this really cool programming language called Rust. And I figured, surely, Rust has you know, the ability to talk to, to C. So maybe there's something we can do about that. So Rust is a systems programming language that is uh, being developed by Mozilla. Uh, it's, it runs blazingly fast, it prevents seg faults, and guarantees thread safety. Um, so a lot of guarantees that it boasts there. Um, but apparently, it's actually been proven. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's got all these really cool things like zero cost abstractions and traits, um, guarantees memory safety, and no race conditions, and things like that. It also has efficient C bindings, which is kind of what we need in order to uh, interact with the beam. So I figured, let's put these two together, Elixir and Rust. Um, now, of course, when I was researching this, I figured, OK, if I'm thinking about this, surely someone else is also thinking about it that actually knows what they're doing. So maybe I can you know, search and find something. Uh, and, and sure enough, I found this library. It's called Erlang Nifsys. And so it's a crate that's on uh, Crates.io, which is the package manager for the uh, Rust ecosystem. And this is essentially just a, a wrapper. Uh, it's got all these Rust bindings to the, the C API. And it allows you to use that API very similar, similarly to how you would use the Erlang API. Uh, but you're just doing it in Rust. Um, of course, there's a lot of unsafe functions in here um, because it's actually dealing with direct pointers and things like that. And so if you do use it incorrectly, um, you can still kind of cause problems and crash the beam if you're not doing uh, things properly. Um, so I saw this, and I thought, man, this would be really cool to like, make a higher, higher level abstraction around it. Um, but luckily enough, uh, I searched a little bit more, and I found this library, which was like, yes, I don't have to write it. Um, so this, this is uh, Rustler, um, is created by uh, a gentleman by the name of Hans uh, Josephson out of Norway. And uh, when I first found this library, I was really excited about it. And um, unfortunately, I went to go and write my first project. And I'm on Mac, and it didn't, didn't work. So um, luckily, that gave me an opportunity to actually get in and, and uh, tinker with it and contribute some, uh, some back to the project, get it, get it up and running on, on Mac, get Travis CI running, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so Rustler is essentially a project that um, is a library for writing Erlang NIFs, obviously, uh, but in Rust safe code, which means that you should never be able to crash the beam uh, with a NIF written in with Rustler. So it provides all the facilities for generating boilerplate and things like that uh, to, um, to start off a, a new project. Uh, it handles all the encoding and decoding of Erlang terms to Rust types and, and vice versa. Um, and the thing, thing that it does is it catches any Rust panics um, inside uh, the, the, the actual NIF itself before it unwinds back into C, which would cause a seg fault and crash the beam. Um, so to get started, um, you just kind of create a new uh, mix project. So mix new JSON. Um, we add Rustler to our dependencies. Um, the code that I'm showing today is using master, so if you want to do that, you can specify uh, sparse Rustler mix here with GitHub, the path there, um, because uh, the Rustler repo itself is, is a list of like a bunch of different projects all in one repo, uh, and this Rustler stuff lives in Rustler mix. Um, we fetch the dependencies, and then we have this uh, mix task called rustler.new. Uh, we can specify a module name. So in this case, we'll say JSON. It asks us what library name. Um, and since I'm going to be using a Rust crate called JSON, I wanted to name mine separately so that it doesn't conflict. So I'll call it fast.json. And then it generates a bunch of files for us. So the next thing, you just add the Rustler compiler to the compilers uh, in your project. And we specify Rustler crates option, which we'll call this function down here. And uh, oops. so this essentially is just all the crates that our uh, project is going to, to house. So we have a JSON crate. We tell it the path. 
We specify the mode in which we want the cargo compiler uh, project to, to uh, compile in. So if, we're, if our mix env is not production, then we just uh, use debug so it's faster for, for compiling. Otherwise, we'll compile in the release mode. <coughs> so uh, this was our module before Rustler, and this is our module after Rustler. So we just use Rustler, specify our OTP app name, and then our functions there. So we actually generate and um, we generate the the on init callback and the init function automatically for you. Um, and this is our first bit of Rust code. So we have our lib rs, and this houses our all of our code for our NIF. So we use uh, we pull in our extern crate for Rustler. Um, we have a crate called uh, there's a crate called lazy static. So you can create uh, like static things. We use it for uh, all the atoms, um, because atoms are not garbage collected, so we need some sort of like static uh, provided way for that. So um, down here we have this Rustler export NIFS macro, and this is basically like the the Earl NIF init macro in C. Um, we tell it the module name, and then we have a list of tuples where we have the uh, function in the module, that, followed by the arity, and then a pointer to a function in our uh, our code here. So we have a decoder module, and that inside that module has a decode function. And then down here we have some like other information for like loading. Uh, if we want to uh, do some extra work when we're loading, then we can pass something different here. So I'll, I'll get to that after uh, after some other slides. Um, so we are also in this case we're pulling in extern crate JSON. So it's a it's a Rust library uh, for parsing JSON. And all right, so let's take the simple approach. So we're just using a Rust crate for parsing JSON. Um, we are going to decode a binary string into Rust types, um, and then we're going to convert those Rust types into Erlang terms and then return it to our, our uh, caller. All right, so this is our decoder. Um, we're just pulling in uh, all the different types that we're going to use, and then we have our decode function. So the functions, the uh, the NIF, this is actually the NIF function here, it takes the env as the first argument. Um, we have the list of args, so this is just a slice, like a byte slice of terms, um, and then it's going to return a result of term or an error. So um, one of the things I really like about Rust is that there's no like exceptions. You don't throw exceptions. You just return res you return types. So um, if we have if we have an error, then we can just return an error, and it gets propagated up. And so, other thing that's really nice about this too is that if this decode function uh, is unable to decode, um, this is also going to return a result type as well. And this question mark operator here at the end will basically safely try to unwrap the value and give you the OK wrapped value, and if it's not, un, unable to, if, it's, if it returns an error, then it just does an early return, and you end up returning the error. So in this case, we just call uh, match, uh, which is doing some pattern matching. Um, so the thing I like about Rust as well is that it fits nice with Erlang and, and, uh, and Elixir with pattern matching. Um, obviously, it's not as robust in, with being able to like mix and match and all that kind of stuff, but um, you do have the ability to match on, on the patterns here. So we, we match on JSON to parse, and if we get an OK with some JSON, then we pass that off to another function that'll actually go and do the work um, right here. And then if we get, and then we just return uh, a tuple of OK and the actual like terms uh, in, in Erlang terms. Um, if we get an error, then we just return a, an error tuple with, with an error. Um, and this is the actual like heavy lifting of converting. It's just a big recursive loop that takes all the uh, the JSON values and encodes them into Erlang Erlang values. So let's time this NIF and see what we do. So if we get some big big JSON here, we've got like an eight megabyte file. It's not too big really, but um, big enough to be interesting. Um, so if we time it with timer.c, or tc rather, we can see here this take, takes 1.5 seconds. So with 8 megabytes of JSON running on this tiny little computer, it takes 1.5 seconds. Um, 
it's not that bad, right? Um, you know, and most, most languages have the ability to like, you know, call out to some uh, like C library, like you know, Ruby, Ruby's JSON parser is all written in C and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, in those languages, if it takes a long time, you just deal with it, right? Um, but, but what's, there's actually a problem here uh, when you're dealing with, with, with the Erlang runtime. And if we go back to that error that we had at the beginning, there's a section in here that talks about a native function doing a length, lengthy work uh, before returning degrades the responsiveness of the VM. Um, and so this can actually cause all kinds of different uh, bad behaviors. Um, and actually, it like, starts reading as like one of those, uh, uh, those, those commercials that talk about the, uh, the problems with taking certain drugs. Um, you know, such, as, such strange behaviors include, but are not limited to, extreme memory usage and bad load balancing be between schedulers. So um, there's actually a lot of things uh, that the folks at Basho uh, with the, the React database had found um, where, you know, certain long-running NIFs were causing the threads to actually, or the, the scheduler threads to actually uh, shut down and, and uh, not be used anymore and, and all kinds of weird things. Um, so let's take a look at a little bit deep dive on the, the Erlang VM ar architecture so we can kind of understand what's, why that's just a problem. So normally you have uh, a computer, some hardware, uh, some hardware with uh, a bunch of cores. So this has eight cores, and we have like the OS and kernel threads. And then we've got spawn up our program and in the uh, Erlang VM, so we have uh, a single VM process. And then when the VM boots up, it's going to go ahead and spawn uh, eight scheduler threads, so one per CPU core. And these scheduler threads, they each have a run queue. And these run queues are essentially a queue of Erlang processes. And uh, the VM, these, uh, all these individual threads, they're basically looping through all of the processes and running their code. So we just pop off the head of the queue, we run some bytecode, and the bytecode is essentially going, the, the scheduler is going to run this process until the, the, the process calls some bytecode that might block, right? So if it goes and tries to read from the file system, uh, it knows that it's going to take a little while before that result actually comes back, so it will preempt the process, move it to an, a different queue until the message arrives, which then it'll move it back to the end of this queue. Um, uh, so some other examples are if it's doing a network I.O. or anything like that, or if the process goes into a, a selective receive waiting for a message in its mailbox, um, it will do that as well. But if a process is doing only CPU bound work, then uh, it has a, a limit that it has uh, of what's called 2,000 reductions. So the, the virtual machine basically keeps track of function calls that the process is making, and it limits it to 2,000 function calls. Uh, it's kind of a rough equivalent. It's not like a precise, exact thing. Um, so, and so, these uh, all these processes are just being uh, cooperative automatically. They don't have to worry about anything. Um, so, there's another thing that's pretty interesting too. Is that uh, you can, if you want to take a picture of this or whatever, it's in the OTP repo. Um, this is a document called Thread Progress, and it essentially explains how the, uh, the schedulers actually kind of work together and communicate. Um, so Thread Progress boils down to um, the fact that the schedulers all kind of share some, uh, some data structures and uh, memory that, you know, they don't want to um, do garbage collection on certain things when maybe it's still being used by other, thre uh, other schedulers. Um, and so protecting them with locks or ref counts um, doesn't scale. I think they had in the, in the past used uh, st stuff like that to, to make this work, but it, it actually ended up being slow. Um, so they kind of removed these locks and, and did this thread progress thing. Um, and so instead of doing that, the schedulers frequently kind of report progress to all the other schedulers. Um, and they use this knowledge um, of this progress um, to basically determine when certain operations are, are safe to, to run. Um, so the problem 
here is, is basically you don't want to blo block the schedulers. Um, if you block the scheduler, um, it prevents pr thread progress, prevents schedulers from being able to schedule processes. Um, and uh, that is where the NIFs come in. So when you write a NIF, you essentially are writing machine code. When the scheduler is now running that process, it's running machine code, which now cannot be preempted. And uh, if you block the scheduler, you can basically throw everything off. And so the documentation says that you should never allow a NIF to run for more than one millisecond. Um, obviously, that's pretty long, even in the, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the grand scheme of things. So you should definitely return as fast as possible. Um, and also, when you do this, reductions are not being counted. Um, so it's really, really important that things are, are done correctly. So, um, so you want to actually count reductions when you're doing this, too. So um, one thing we can do to see how our, our function is actually working is we can write this uh, function to count reductions. Um, we're basically just uh, sending our, our, our caller a message um, with the amount of time and this information here. Um, we can call process.info on, on the process to get the reductions. Um, we call the function, we time the difference there, and we just send this as a, as a message to the parent. Um, all right, so this is what we get back when we've done that. And um, you can see here that the diff of the reductions is only 10. So when we call our function, we've done all this work. We took like one and a half seconds to do it, and it's only uh, 10 reductions. So we can do better than this. So one thing that we need to do, or what we can do, is, is chunking. Um, what this basically is is that you have to write your, your NIF in a way that it can, does only a tiny bit of work at one time, and then it can return uh, and then be called again to do the next bit of work. So this is really difficult for a lot of things. Um, so basically, I ended up having to write my own like hand-rolled JSON parser which sucks, uh, and it's not that great. So uh, this is our new JSON file here. We've got um, two new functions. We've got a decode init, and then we've got um, our decode iter down here. So these are the two um, NIFs. Uh, so we, we call decode with our data. We pipe it through decode init, which is our, our, our NIF to, that's going to initialize the NIF. Um, and then it's going to return us a value that we can then call it pass to decode result. Um, so we're going to match on this on decode result. If, it, if we get OK data, then we know we're good, and we can just return the data. Um, if we get this tuple of more and this thing called a resource, which we'll get into, and some accumulator, then we know that we need to do more work. So we get the resource, we pass that into decode iter with the accumulator, and then we just call decode result again, which is recursing over this thing. Uh, and then we will eventually get the result. Oops. All right, so resource objects. So this is, this is pretty interesting. Uh, resource objects are basically a safe way to pass a pointer from a, to like a native data structure that's inside the VM uh, to the Erlang world. So you can call an if, get this thing back, and you can't really, u really use it other than to just pass it back into an if. Um, but it's like if you do try to like inspect it, it's just going to look like an empty binary. Um, so this is a way to kind of like store uh, information in memory in, in low-level uh, native code, um, but then be able to pass it back in and pass it around. Um, one thing that's really actually interesting about resource objects is that you can actually share them with other processes. So you can actually do really crazy, interesting things like maybe have a mutable state thing that uh, could cause wreak havoc if you're not doing it correctly. Um, but it's a really interesting idea that I kind of want to play with and see what I can do. Um, but yeah, so eventually like a resource object is really just to pass back and forth between your NIF and, and the Beam or, and the Erlang uh, code. All right, so let's uh, take a look at this again. Um, so now we have removed our We've removed the JSON crate, so we're not going to use that anymore um, because that doesn't work. Um, we now have our own hand-rolled parser and some thing called a sync that we basically are storing our terms in. 
Uh, and we have our two new functions here. So we have decode init, um, which is uh, arity2. And then, which actually, yeah, it might only be arity1. But anyways, uh, decode iter has uh, two, uh, arity of two. And then now, instead of returning none here, we're actually doing some work. So we have this uh, decoder parse, uh, parser resource, which is a struct in, uh, in Rust. And so we're going to call this load function afterwards, which is going to initialize that struct uh, and basically make our resource. Um, and then we just return true at the end. OK. So in our decode init function here, um, we now have our struct here. Um, and it has inside of it a mutex of a parser struct. And essentially, in our, in our NIF here, we're going to call decode init. We're going to get the actual args out, which is like the, the binary that we're going to uh, decode. We are going to get our resource out of the NIF. And we're going to create a vector of terms, which is just an empty vector. And then we're going to call. Immediately, we're going to call our other NIF. So we're going to call decode iter, passing in the, uh, the structure that it requires. So we're just basically um, returning very fast uh, from, from this. Um, all right, so decode iter uh, is going to receive the, the arguments, as we did before. And we're going to pull out our resource from the args. We're going to create a sync stack to stick our terms in that we get and we collect. Um, and then we're going to create a sync. Um, so this is basically for the, the iterative stuff. So if we've already had one, it's going to essentially um, keep reusing the same structure over and over again. Um, so we create a parser and we try to parse. Um, one thing you'll notice here is that we have to uh, get our resource and try to obtain a lock on it. So because it's wrapped in a mutex, um, and we, we need to make sure that uh, only one, one thread can actually operate on, at once. Um, this thing will return like a, a what's called a, a guard, and that will return either an error or OK. All right, so then essentially we are now going to just try and get going with, uh, with the, uh, the parsing. So we're going to call consume time slice on this parser, and we'll just keep going over and over. If this consume time slice ever returns uh, true, then we know we need to exit out of the loop and return uh, back with a uh, thing with the tuple of more. So we know that we have more data. All right, so I think I'm running short on time here. But we have uh, the results now here. We can see that we have now 11,300 reductions, um, which is much, much better. Uh, so a couple of other things that we can do is uh, rescheduling. Um, this currently is not available inside of Rustler. Um, the main reason is because we can't actually uh, ensure that it's, the API is actually going to be used correctly at compile time. And one of the goals for Rustler is to ensure that you can never crash the beam. Uh, which means that we need to make sure at compile time that you're not that the API is not able to be used incorrectly. So um, that's something we're trying to figure out how to do in the future. Um, the last thing is that we can do what's called threaded NIFs. And because Rust has its own concurrency and threads and all that kind of stuff, we don't actually have to worry about using the NIF API's threading models. Um, we can just use Rust. So we can basically spawn an operating system thread to do the work. Uh, we send the results back to the calling process. And this is basically what that looks like. So we have decode threaded. Um, we call uh, thread spawn. And we have our, uh, our caller environment. Um, we spawn the, the work into a closure, which then actually does all the work. Um, but right here, we're actually calling and spawning this thread. And then we're immediately returning OK back to the caller. And then once this is actually done, the result that's returned from this uh, closure is what gets sent to the process. So, and this is kind of what it looks like. We call decode threaded, which returns OK. And then we just wait and receive block. Um, and then we can time out if we, want, uh, if we don't receive anything. 
So the last thing here that we'll talk about is dirty NIFs. Um, the beam at starting at uh, OTP 20 uh, is, is now, by default, it's turned on. It was experimental, experimental for a while. And it allows you to call NIFs without worrying about blocking the normal schedulers. There's actually like a set, another set of schedulers that uh, get created for you that you can do work on there. Um, this is kind of how you use it. You've got the scheduler flags. And in your um, exports here, you can just specify dirty CPU if it's CPU bound work, or dirty I.O. if it's I.O. bound work. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's that. Um, I do have a quick demo if I have time. Um, I just kind of like hacked something together in, um, in about 30 minutes while I was doing the talk. But, um, or while somebody else was doing a talk, rather. And this is called Beamcoin. And uh, it's basically, it's a NIF that uh, does some, you know, blockchain, Bitcoin kind of stuff here. Um, so we have a native mine here. We're kind of going to call a, a native mine, which is going to essentially uh, call into this NIF to go and mine some, some Bitcoin. Um, and here's the source code. It basically, uh, it spawns a thread, and then that thread then spawns four other threads, and they go and actually calculate a hash ending in six zeros. Um, so the, uh, it, it's actually quite, quite difficult. Uh, it takes some time to do. Um, if you were to do this in Erlang or Elixir, it would probably take a lot longer. Um, so. Uh, this basically spawns a bunch of threads, does a bunch of work, and then sends the result back to the main thread, which then is the thing that sends the result back to the calling process. So if we run this, you'll see H top over here that my, my CPU is getting a workout. And uh, I think before this took about like one minute. So. Um, yeah, so anyways, while that's running, uh, NIFs are awesome. They're scary, especially if you are writing it in C. Uh, but now we have Rust, which is awesome. And it really helps you to write code that you're going to be actually more comfortable deploying into production. Um, but there's still a lot of ways that you can shoot yourself in the foot. And so I hope that. What I've shown you today really kind of at least allows you to start thinking about how to do this uh, in a, uh, the proper way. And uh, wow, this, this is faster this time, 50 seconds. It was 53 seconds before. So sweet. Yeah, so it computed the hash with six zeros on the end. It found, found the one there. And uh, so now we have a Bitcoin miner on, uh, in an if. So all right, cool. Enjoy. Thank you. First question, as always, do you have a white paper? No. Uh, we have a README, though. Uh, well, it's the start. Any questions? Um, that first implementation you had, the one that, um, that kind of caused some, com uh, some confusion in the schedule, yeah. it took like a 1.5 second for it, you said. Um, what, were, what were the speeds of the other implementations? What was the what? Um, the speeds of the other implementations, like once you solved that schedule, Oh sure. So yeah, yeah. So the question is, is that the first example took like one one point five seconds when it was blocking the scheduler, um, and the question is, is did the others? How it was the timing on the other ones? Um, they're they're right around the same. Um, sometimes they're a little bit slightly longer, um, like the threaded one because there's a little bit of overhead, like spawning another thread. Um, you'll you might run into some a little bit of latent, latency there, um, but. Yeah, it just depends on, on the, how big the input is and you know, what makes sense for that particular thing. More questions? If not, a quick, oh, yeah. In the last example, you're using all four cores. Are you spawning four threads to do that? Yeah. Yeah. So the first one that went So there's actually five threads total because there's the main thread, and then that thread spawns four other threads. So it's obviously not very good. It, on a, f a computer that only has four virtual cores. So, 
but yeah. Yeah, so uh, the question is about dirty NIFs and them like interrupt or like causing yeah. problems with stuff. Yeah, so even if you use dirty NIFs, uh, the dirty schedulers rather, you should still try to do your work as fast as possible so that you're not running into, like, because if you're spawning a lot of dirty NIFs, that, that uh, dirty NIF scheduler is going to end up getting clogged up as well. Um, but it's not blocking the main uh, scheduler, which is where all the processors are running on. Um, but yeah, you can still cause a, you know, problems that way as well. And obviously, this example of the Bitcoin stuff also could potentially cause problems because I'm actually stealing CPU resources from the beam completely, right? So um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Do you want to repeat that? The comment? Uh, uh, the comment was basically about uh, creating a thread pool that's outside of the beam, uh, so that you can, you know, schedule schedule your your NIF work on a separate uh, thread pool. A uh, quick thing, by the way, uh, for those of you who are <coughs> interested in how NIFs uh, might be done in C, uh, perhaps a little uh, less scarily. Uh, Richard Pallas, who's sitting over here at David Hall, in this room last year that I also was hosting, um, about uh, various tools and techniques for uh, writing and debugging uh, CNIFs, uh, including using GDB and various tools, including ETP, which I hadn't heard of a, a, until that time. Um, and uh, so you might want to check it out on YouTube if you want to see, again, you know, the way uh, that people might do that in C, if you're willing to be scared a little bit anyway. I'm trying to, was there a talk on it or was it? Uh, uh, I don't know, it's, it's just the writing in my C stuff in your LA code. And it does the path transform and it, it's amazing. Right. <laughs> you might want to mention both of these, I guess, if you can, just to get in the video, perhaps. Uh, What's that? To mention Niffy as a tool to look at and, uh, and Richard Callis' talk from last year. Yeah. Or is that too hard to do? I, it probably is too hard to okay. do. <laughs> But if you didn't hear it, it's N I F F Y, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. No more? Well, if you come up with anything later, Sonny will be around, so uh, you can hit him up. Thank you again. Thank you.